Welcome everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us for the first installment of this year's uh, Spring Seminar Series hosted by the Stavros Niafos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University. My name is Dimitris Kralis and I'm the director of uh, the center. Uh, each year, we invite scholars working in Hellenic studies, widely conceived, to present their research on a wide range of uh, topics in the fields of archeology, span classics, Byzantine, Ottoman, and modern Greek history, as well as literary and cultural studies. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this event was organized at Simon Fraser University on uh, Burnaby Mountain, which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Slaytooth, Musqueam, and Coquitlam peoples. Before I introduce today's uh, presenter, I would like to remind everyone that this uh, webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions or concerns about SFU's Zoom privacy and security guidelines, I would ask you to visit the SFU IT services uh, website. I'm pleased to present today, uh, for the second time in this uh, uh, series, over a few years, Dr. Megan Daniels, Assistant Professor of Ancient Greek Material Culture at the University of British Columbia. Her interests include religion and cr cross-cultural interaction in the Bronze and Iron Age Mediterranean world, as well as the political discourses of divine kingship between Greece, Asia, and Egypt. She's interested in cross-disciplinary approaches to the ancient world and has a forthcoming co-edited volume on data science and social sciences approaches to the ancient Mediterranean religion, and, other, and another edited volume on interdisciplinary approaches uh, to ancient migration and mobility. Her current book project is a study of the evolution of divine kingship over the late Bronze and Iron Age in the Eastern Mediterranean. In addition to her publication program, Dr. Daniels is one of the co-founders of Peopling the Past, a digital humanities initiative that hosts free open access resources for teaching and learning about real people in the ancient world and the people who study them. I hope you will enjoy today's presentation titled Intimacy with the Gods, Nude Female Imagery in Greek Sanctuaries. Uh, after the end of the talk, uh, we will have a short discussion about the modalities of uh, our conversation. But for now, let us now uh, welcome Dr. Daniels. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Thank you to the uh, Stavros Narcos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies for inviting me here. Uh, let me share my screen here. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I am currently in Kitsilano on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I work at UBC, which is the territory, unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. So, um, I'm going to talk to you today about one of my current favorite topics. I'm interested in religion and cross-cultural interaction, as Dr. Carlos noted. And this is part, this research does relate to my, my larger interests in divine kingship in the ancient world and the ancient Eastern Mediterranean. And to start off with the nude female figurine, I want to start with this image or set of images, which depicts some examples of what Mediterranean and Near Eastern archeologists call the nude female figurine, or sometimes the nude female goddess. And, you know, just I'll ask you what comes to mind when you see this imagery. Most of these are not very large. I don't have scales, but they can be held in your hand. And uh, the examples that I'm showing you were dedicated in votive, as, as votives in sanctuaries to various goddesses. So just maybe think about what words or concepts come to mind, what messages this imagery might be sending, and perhaps what the purpose of this dedication might have been for a worshiper. Because a lot of this talk will deal with our, our preconceived ideas of what female nudity actually means. I've long been fascinated by these figurines, uh, in particular their emergence in the Greek world. Uh, as I noted, they appear primarily as small figurines deposited in sanctuaries to goddesses, although some appear on, on metal vessels and graves, and they can either appear with arms straight down by their sides, I'll just go back to this slide, um, with, our, with hands supporting their breasts, with one hand in the genital region and one hand on the breast, or sometimes as more elaborately with both arms raised and holding attributes like plants or animals. And this is imagery first is a very long history. It first appears in Mesopotamia in the middle of the third millennium BCE. So all the way on the right hand side of the screen. And I'll, I'll go into this history in due course. In the Greek world, however, on the left hand side, um, the nude female figurines have a relatively quick by archeologist standards rise and decline in their popularity. They appear first about 800 BCE and decline shortly after 600 BCE. 
And this general period 800 to 600 belongs within what archaeologists tend to call the archaic period, kind of straddling the geometric and archaic periods. This is my crude timeline of Greek history, ancient Greek history. And the term archaic period is, is somewhat of an art historical based term, and it, it's mostly denoting the lead up to what is called the classical period, which starts with the Greeks driving off the Persians from Greek soil in the Persian Wars and then going on to usher in what's still commonly referred to as a golden age in art, architecture, politics, sciences, and literature, encapsulated by what we see uh, in, this, in this slide. And I think it's appropriate to start with this particular periodization of Greek history because of what it represents in terms of the divisions that we tend to draw between East and West, um, which is a really important theme of this talk, this tendency to separate Greece from Egypt and the Near East. And these divisions and the problems within these, with these divisions are presented really potently in works by uh, people like Edward Said. Um, his book in 1978, Orientalism Laid Bare, these more assiduous assumptions of Western superiority via cultural caricatures of the Middle East and really essentializing definitions of anything considered Eastern uh, as the antithesis to the West. And in Said's view, Orientalism infused all aspects of Western thought and formed this major ideological impetus for political and military domination in the modern era. Yet its roots uh, very well could be found in the post-Persian War era of Greece. Uh, it's clear from fifth century Greek literature and art that there was this idea of division between the Greeks and what they would have called the non-Greeks or barbarians. Um, here's the vase painting. I could have shown some other ones that caricature the Persians in certain ways, um, uh, but showing a Greek fighting a Persian and clearly differentiating uh, the, the clothing um, and the hairstyles. Um, one of the most famous historians of Greece, Herodotus, um, also notes that he bases his entire purpose of his work, which we tend to refer to as the histories, to document how and why the Greeks and Persians warred with one another. And in the early pages of this history, he clearly indicates his awareness of the separation between Europe and Asia, stating for Asia and the barbarians living there, the Persians regard as their own but Europe and the Hellenic region they consider to be separate. That being said, it's easy to be seduced by standout pieces like vase painting and the histories of Herodotus. And when we dig deeper, there's always a more complex story to tell. And I think the nude female figurine nicely captures this complexity. So for the first part of the talk, I'd like to examine two strains of thought that have colored how we understand the nude female and its symbolic meanings. The first is this these Orientalist assumptions of how the Greek world related to cultural, the cultural groups of Western Asia, what's generally called the Near East, or sometimes modern day terms, the Middle East. And with discussions of Orientalism will also outline the Near Eastern background of this imagery and its appearance in the Greek world. And the second strain of thought, which I haven't introduced yet, is, is the second main bullet point, the, the meaning of nudity, what nudity actually symbolized in the ancient world. Uh, and these assumptions about female nudity also uh, tie in with Orientalist assumptions. And then I'll present some of the research I've done on these figurines, in particular what, uh, what nudity and the gestures these figurines take, um, such as the, the, one, the gesture this one is taking here, what they might have symbolized, both in their long-term history across the third and second millennia, which is called the Bronze Age, um, and in particular in this period between about 800 and 600 BCE. So to get a clearer view on the Orientalist assumptions built into the interpretation of these figurines, I think it's worth noting a further time division within the Archaic period, which I already introduced, and that's between about 750 and 600 BCE. Um, this is traditionally a, a kind of extra period slotted in there called the Orientalizing period. And this is the period into which most of these figurines fall with their appearance in the Greek world. And this title, Orientalizing, um, clearly shows how this period was defined in terms of modern day scholars. Um, this was namely a time when um, Greeks and others, for example, peoples living in Italy, um, were uh, thought to kind of look to the more culturally and technologically advanced East for inspiration. And this is a process that's often summed up with the term ex oriente lux, or light from the East. 
So Greece in this period was portrayed as emerging from the throes of a so-called dark age, uh, following the collapse of societies around the Eastern Mediterranean around 1200 BCE. This is often called the Bronze Age collapse when um, peoples from the Hittites to the Bronze Age Greeks to kingdoms in the Levant and Egypt experienced a number of social, economic and political calamities. And this, the following period in the Greek world uh, after this kind of dark age is often termed the eighth century revolution when the Greeks experienced a cultural and economic resurgence, um, you know, characterized by population growth, the emergence of writing and administrative systems, long distance trade, the appearance of monumental sanctuaries and the developments of art and literature. In short developments which set Greece on its path to, to this classical period, the so-called golden age of the, of the Greek polis. So the role of the Near East in this process, uh, it was emphasized in earlier pieces of scholarship, um, but it received special emphasis in the 1980s and 90s. This is some, some of the research history of this, of, of examining these interrelations. Uh, Walter Burkett wrote in German, the Orientalizing Revolution in 1984, translated in 1992 into English. Uh, Martin West wrote in 1997, the East Face of Helicon, and these, two books were really influential. They focused heavily on showing that so much of what was going on in Greece between about 800 and 600 was due to influence from the Near East, from artistic motifs to myths and literature. Um, and Burkert's definition of this period is pretty telling. He says the orientalizing period is that decisive epoch in which under the influence of the Semitic East, Greek culture began its unique flowering soon to assume cultural hegemony in the Mediterranean. So in some, this, this time period was seen as one of artistic stimulus from East to West that pushed Greece into the position of cultural hegemon. And more works have, recent works have certainly questioned and complicated this assumption of the one-way flow of influence and have problematized ideas about cultural superiority and we certain, certainly built on what Burkert and West have done in more nuanced fashion. But many of the artistic artifacts and artistic motifs that emerged in this period between about 800 and 600 are still chalked up to notions of just artistic influence, uh, the circulation of prestige items, and, and the deeper social and political meanings of the symbolism were often missed as a result. And I think the nude female is no exception. And that's really my point is to kind of draw attention to the deeper social and political meanings of this imagery. One of the most important works on the nude female is Nano Marinatos's 2000 uh, monograph, The Goddess and the Warrior, where she demonstrates uh, all these cultural, fascinating cultural links between this imagery with Greece and the Near East, and really argues convincingly for the social meanings of this imagery in the Greek world. If she still chalks up the nude female's appearance in Greece to a brief flirtation with the East, she writes, naked goddesses appear in Greece in the eighth century, flourish during the seventh, the orientalizing period par excellence, and they vanish by the sixth. They represent the short-lived but important courtship of Greece with the Near East, which has been stressed recently by many scholars. So there are many ways in which we can move past simple modes of cultural transmission and really probe the shared social meanings and ideologies that this type of symbolism uh, might have represented. And I think ideologies that were really shared and circulated for centuries amongst different groups. One of the other groundbreaking treatments of the artistic interrelations between Greece and the Near East to Sarah Morris's Daedalus and the Origins of Greek Art. Um, and in many ways, this was a more nuanced treatment of Greek and Near Eastern cultural interactions. And she argued especially that these interactions weren't confined to this orientalizing period, but went back to the Bronze Age. And I, I very much agree with this premise of looking deeper into history, which is what I'll do in this presentation. And so before delving into these long-term associations and ideologies, I, I do want to just briefly consider the context in which this, the nude female appears in the Greek world, which is mainly sanctuaries, but to some extent graves as well. So one of the hallmarks of this so-called orientalizing period, um, and which I think is really significant for understanding this imagery is the proliferation of monumental sanctuaries across mainland Greece and the Greek islands, Crete, uh, as well as the west coast of Turkey, which is referred to as East Greece or Ionia or Asia Minor. And this period in general has been called the age of sanctuaries. Uh, many 
sanctuaries show a startling amount of dedicated objects made in gold, bronze, ivory. Here's a, a slide. I'm not going to go through all these sanctuaries, of course, but here's just an example of some of the major sanctuaries that emerge around the Greek world in this period and have a, a, some of them have just a stunning amount of objects. They, um, uh, they include, for example, the sanctuary to Hera is one of the most famous ones. Um, and the places like the sanctuary to Hera exhibited this huge influx of foreign votives um, in the form of sculpture, weapons, equestrian equipment, vessels, cauldrons like you see on the right, bronze cauldrons, um, ivory containers and fur furniture fittings. You can see this lion furniture, ivory furniture fitting. Um, here's the map just kind of showing the, the, where everything comes from, from the temple of here on Samos. You can see stuff coming from as far as uh, Armenia and Iran. Mm -hmm. And they were called, they were termed exotica. They were excavated in the 19th and 20th centuries. They joined a number of other really interesting finds being unearthed across the Mediterranean that dated to this period, uh, including in Italy, a lot of the Etruscan tombs had this like really fascinating metalwork, uh, gold and, and bronze, as well as ivories. And they really, they were taking on not just the materials, but styles like heraldic lions. It's kind of hard to see, but you can maybe look closely see these kind of marching lions. Um, and things like sphinxes and griffins that were really associated with Neo-Assyrian and Phoenician styles. And so all of these kind of assemblages is what prompted people to start calling this the Orientalizing period. And it seemed to be promulgated by a, a increasing wealth and population and the growth of, of an interconnected elite culture across these regions. Um, just to give you one example, from all from about the same period, uh, let's say between about 700 to 500 BCE, you can see images, for example, of elites in Greece, Italy, and Assyria partaking in a similar type of drinking party that the Greeks came to call the symposium. And it's within these, these larger orientalizing assemblages that the nude female figurines appear. Um, interestingly, they are made in, they tend to be made in terracotta. They're not always made in terracotta but they tend to be locally made terracotta specimens. And so, you know, experts still said, well, they're still exotic. They're still something that the, Greek, you know, that the Greeks imported from the Near East. Uh, but given the symbolism of this imagery, its appearance in sanctuaries as a dedicated object and, and its transmission over long periods of time across numerous cultural groups, I think we should see the nude female as more than just an exotic import. And I'll suggest rather that this imagery represented particular ways of relating to a deity that was bound up with ideologies of power and legitimacy that were shared between groups around the Near East and the Mediterranean. And this is my interest, especially in divine kingship, which was a type of rulership obviously blessed by the gods, and hence the title of this talk, Intimacy with the Gods. Uh, the first comprehensive study on the nude female figurines in the Greek world is this, it's probably hard to see, but it's a German publication by Stephanie Boom, who cataloged the appearance of these female, nude females across various media across, and across Greece. And, you know, it's been 30 years since this publication, so we have to add some more examples that have since been unearthed, particularly from the island of Crete. But it's from this table, you can see that this kind of map graph that a large range of locales across Ionia, Crete, and mainland Greece produced this image. Um, and it, as I said, it also appeared as part of grave symbolages. And Boom, you know, she divided these into different types. It's um, basically with type A being hands by their sides, type B, hands supporting the breasts. Um, type C with, with both hands on the abdomen or general, genital area, and then type D being uh, a more a kind of combination of type B and C. And sometimes in the Greek world, the, the nude female could be also more elaborate. Now, this example of this drawing on the right is not from Greece, but it's an example of this kind of more elaborate version where the nude female, actually here's an example from Greece. Um, there's four of them here with, where the nude female is standing on animals and holding animals in her hands. So all of these image types that Boom uh, recognized corresponds to, correspond to earlier precedents from the Bronze Age Near East. And it's vital to consider this, this long-term background and what these images might have mean, meant across these regions to understand what their 
meaning in Iron Age Greece. So I'll, I'll go into the briefest of histories of where we first see this appear. Um, and this is in Sumer or Mesopotamia. This is a, a drawing once again of a vase handle um, showing a schematized nude female from the Mesopotamian city state of Kish uh, near the sanctuary of the great goddess Ishtar and dated to about 2500 BCE. <laughs> and it seems to start in Mesopotamia and really it kind of explodes across the Near East in especially in the second millennium BCE, um, roughly 2000 to 1000 BCE. And uh, several city-states, I'm showing you examples from this region. Once again, these are drawings of actual specimens show uh, at first a kind of what are called bird-faced figurines supporting their breasts. Um, and then these later on become more quote unquote normal faced figurines. And these are from the city states of Alalach and Ebla. And both of the, and many of these city states where the nude female appears had um, what the main goddess that they worshiped was the great Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar. And scholars tend to associate the, the nude female as a type of imagery associated with Ishtar. And so the, the main features at first included this frontal facing design, uh, nudity, um, and the arms could be straight against the body. They could be holding attributes, uh, stretching out their hands upwards. They could be supporting their breasts or indicating their genitalia. And we see this imagery in many different types of media though. It appears commonly on cyl cylinder seals across Turkey, Syria, Mesopotamia, and parts of the Levant. And um, once again, she, the, the, there's many variations, once again, standing on animals, um, wearing headdresses, holding animals, holding weapons. Um, and she seems to often be associated with royal human figures or other, and other fantastic creatures. Um, also in this second millennium period, starting around 1500 BCE, we get a plainer version of this, um, this type of imagery show up on terracotta plaques and figurines. Um, they tend to be very small, um, simple, not as elaborate as what was shown in the previous slides. And one of the excavators in the 1930s in this region, William Albright, he excavated profusely in places like Israel, originally called these figurines Astarte figurines or Astarte plaques, which I've got listed down here. Um, Astarte is essentially this the Levantine version of Ishtar who was worshiped in and across Mesopotamia and Syria. And this name has stuck, they, they are still called Astarte plaques, um, but people are ambivalent as to whether this is supposed to be the goddess Astarte, especially given the lack of you know, divine attributes, for example, the headdresses, the wings, the weapons, the animals that are often shown on cylinder seals. Uh, many of them also in the, in the Levant in particular didn't come from religious sites. They tended to come from living like domestic sites, houses, graves. Some came from religious sites, but many saw these small figurines as more kind of like apotropaic charms. Uh, possibly, you know, to ward off evil, maybe associated with female oriented rituals for pregnancy and lactation that these have all been suggested. Um, and, uh, you know, we do, that being said, in the same period in the Levant, we do see more elaborate versions of this nude female show up too. Once again, this the standing on animals holding, she's standing on what looks to be a lion, is holding goats in either hand. And by this period, this is really 14th century BCE, this is really what we call the late Bronze Age period. And we start to see this whole convergence of, um, of, of traits and styles from different regions. For instance, this example, this is a drawing of a small gold pendant from a Syrian city state called Ugarit, which I've got, high, which I've got over here. And you can see this thick kind of rolled out wig that she's wearing. It's, it's, it's taken directly from the Egyptian goddess Hathor, who's always portrayed with this thick rolled out wig. I'm just showing you this small amulet from roughly the same period in Egypt. Um, and she has these cow ears because she's this cow goddess, right? And she has this idea that she nurses the king with her cow milk. We see more schematized versions of this imagery from the same period in the Levant as well, where it's just this Hathor's hairstyle on the head two breasts and navel and then the, the pubic triangle. So they're just these little piriform pendants. 
And later in into later centuries in the Levant, we all, you, you also see another version. I'll come back to this briefly. I am jumping a bit ahead, but you see these kind of wheel made figurines with uh, very heavy breasts. And once again, supporting their breasts with their hands. They're called Judean pillar figurines, but they date once again to this same period in the Greek world around 800 to 600 BCE. Um, and I, I will come back to these. Um, even the island of Cyprus too produces a number of these female figurines and they tend to have the, the bird face figurine that we saw from Syria earlier. So we have thus across Mesopotamia, ancient Turkey, the Levant, Cyprus, and Egypt, a real fascinating convergence of traditions and de deities likely um, by the late bronze age. This is a very international period in the Eastern Mediterranean from about 1500 to 1100 BCE. All regions adopt the same, the general same attributes of the nude standing female. They express it in a variety of media. So they figurines, plaques, uh, stone plaques, like you can see in Egypt, uh, pendants, uh, cylinder seals, uh, every now and then a statue. And it emerges across a number of different contexts, houses, graves, sanctuaries, palaces. And in most cases, the the identity, who these actually are meant to represent is Ishtar, is it Astarte, is it Hathor? It's pretty ambiguous. Um, generally, nudity is not associated with mortal women, though. So there seems to be some type of divinity associated with this imagery. And turning to the Greek world in this late Bronze Age period, uh, you know, over here, we, it's actually quite rare in the Greek world. We have some examples from the, the, the royal shaft graves at Mycenae from about 1600 BCE. These, these are drawings, once again, of a small gold pendant of the, the female making the same gesture with doves across above her head. And it's really, um, they really don't agree, uh, appear in earnest in, in the Greek world until this, the, the orientalizing period between about 800 and 600 BCE. And they tend to be the more simple type, like these, what William Albright called the Astarte plaques or the Astarte figurines. Um, and, let, and they're generally not super elaborate, like some of the versions where she's holding animals or standing on animals. And they primarily come from sanctuaries to Hera, Athena, and Artemis, and Aphrodite. And so they can't be identified to any specific goddess, but I think their relationship to all of these goddesses is significant. And given they appear in the sanctuaries, this really international sanctuaries that I mentioned earlier that just see this wealth of objects from around the world, uh, I think they're, they, they're more than simply just artistic influence or, or rep, they, and they don't simply represent one goddess or another. Uh, I suggest seeing them instead as ritual and symbolic means of interacting with deities that developed amidst these longstanding connections with the Near East. And I now turn to um, further considerations of what nudity specifically meant ideologically and religiously, in particular divine nudity. So I've discussed how the orientalizing and, and orientalism uh, paradigms have colored our notions of the nude female in the Greek world, namely positioning this imagery as an artistic expression of Greece's, you know, brief flirtation with the Near East and the Iron Age, which the Greeks then quickly drop in the sixth century um, and start making images only of clothed females. The second overarching influence involves scholarly assumptions about nudity and, and what nudity meant. And um, female nudity in particular has long been bogged down by quite misogynistic attitudes, both from scholars of, of ancient Greek and Near Eastern world. And the scholar uh, Isaac Cornelius, who wrote a book on the imagery of goddesses in the Near East, I think he, sum, he sums it up well. He simply says, representations of naked women seem to have somewhat bothered earlier scholars working in the ancient Near East. Um, I'll just give you some of the examples that he uses. Uh, one scholar who's writing in the, in the late 19th century uh, of a nude female figurine uh, notes that uh, she now rejoices in her comparatively entirely ana entire anatomy though I regret to stay not clothed. Um, a scholar by the name of Edwards, who published a relief, an Egyptian relief of, of the nude female, noted that such goddesses were associated with, I'm quoting him, sensuousness and self-indulgence. And William Albright, who's the one who excavated the and gave the name to the Astarte plaques in Israel, 
um, he described the goddesses that he thought they represented as nude and savage. And he writes, goddesses of fertility played a much greater role among the Canaanites than they do among other ancient people. And he notes how in uh, Canaanite goddesses were always appearing naked in Egyptian portrayals of the, of the late Bronze Age in striking contrast to the modestly garbed native Egyptian goddesses. Um, and so he saw Canaanite religion uh, in this region as associated with orgiastic nature worship and a cult of fertility in the form of serpent symbols and sensuous nudity in contrast to the much more sober Israelite monotheism. Uh, and I note it's interesting to see parallels behind how biblical archaeologists in the 1930s and 40s treated the Canaanites versus the Israelites, right? It's kind of, again, like this really deep separation um, between these two groups. And pretty harsh assumptions overlaid on the Canaan, what they saw, who they called the Canaanites. And nudity, in, in addition to this lasciviousness and carnality, was also taken as a catch all symbol of generic fertility. Uh, a scholar named Judith Hackett uh, attacked this paradigm back in 1989. And she argued that it was basically, fertility was basically a one word explanation reserved for female deities or goddesses, whereas male deities always received much more nuanced treatment, um, even though many of the male deities themselves are associated with fertility. Um, other scholars have noted the same tendency for those working on Cyprus. And in general, there's this, I, this whole fertility mother goddess paradigm has colored most readings of female imagery from the, from the Neolithic onwards, really. And more recent works have deconstructed this notion of simply just meaning female fertility. Uh, I already mentioned Nano Marinatos. Uh, she actually argued in her book, The Goddess and the Warrior, that the nude female signified the actually the potency of, of the male warrior. She, it was actually an imagery for males in the Greek world via this kind of dangerous uh, frontal sexuality. Others have seen them as part of rituals of procreation and female initiation. And so we've moved beyond the fertility fetish, but scholarship still really focuses on the eroticism um, and the sexuality of the nude female figurine. And I think this interpretation is understandable uh, from a modern perspective, in particular, given the tendency of this imagery to highlight sexual characteristics like the breasts and the genitalia. The, the figure in particular in the middle is, is very uh, much holding her breasts up. And that's definitely something in our culture, you know, in 21st century Canadian society, that you may assume is, is meant to be very sexual. And the goddesses like Ishtar and Astarte are certainly associated with sexuality in various Near Eastern traditions. But while viewing it from our 21st century lens might automatically bring up associations with sex, can we assume that this imagery held the same meaning for ancient Mediterranean and Near Eastern cultural groups? And so what, what actually did the emphasis on the breasts and maybe the genitalia actually symbolize? And so I, I probed, uh, my methodology was to simply look deeper at ancient literature and like, what do the, the breasts mean in, amongst these people? What does the emphasis on the breasts mean? Um, so in some cases, you can find instances where they seem to be sexual and fertile. Um, there's an old Mesopotamian hymn to the goddess Ishtar. Um, she's called Inanna in this hymn, because that's the Sumerian name for her, where her lover sings to her, his name is Demuzi, oh mistress, let your breasts be your fields. Inanna, let your breasts be your fields, your wide fields, which pour forth flax, your wide fields, which pour forth grain, make water flow from them. Um, but more often, the breasts in literature seem to be associated with nurturing, rejuvenation, and also the, 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 a, ways, a way to legitimize kings, heroes, and gods um, it, yeah, in the divine and royal spheres. Uh, many gods, like the Babylonian god Marduk, was emphasized to have suckled the breasts of goddess Gilgamesh. Um, he had a human father, but he was the son of the goddess Ninsun, and he was said to have suckled his mother and was declared to be two thirds divine. He was the king of the Mesopotamian city of Uruk. And fully mortal humans also gained status and power through suckling goddesses. Um, the, an epic tale from the city-state of Ugarit in Syria tells of a king named Tirta, 
Um, and his son was prophesied to, and I, I quote this text, drink the translation of this text, drink the milk of Athirat, he will drain the breast of the virgin. Uh, these are referring to two um, goddesses in this region. Uh, who is the virgin? Um, usually assumed to be the goddess, not Astarte, but the goddess Anat, who is portrayed as winged in, in the literature. Um, from Ugarit, there, this is a drawing of a, a ivory, a, ivory furniture panel showing what seems to be Anat with these wings suckling these two, they're not infants, I guess they're two children. And she's got once again that style, the hairstyle of the goddess Hathor and the cow horns and sun disc that the Egyptian goddess Hathor also would have worn. Um, and I've talked about Ugarit before. We have several other examples of the nude female from Ugarit. So it's important to emphasize the overall trope or idea being expressed in these passages and, and in art, which is namely the suckling of gods, heroes, and kings by goddesses, who in turn convey divinity, authority, power, and legitimacy through their milk, uh, as well as rejuvenation and prosperity in the afterlife. And this trope bears a direct link to Egypt, um, who, uh, where goddesses like Hathor, are often depicted suckling the king in both human and bovine form. You can see this is from the temple of uh, Hatshep, or the mortuary temple of the pharaoh Hatshepsut in the uh, near the Valley of the Kings, showing the king Hatshepsut, who's, a, who's the female king, uh, drinking from the cow Hathor. And this is another god. It's hard to see. This is a lion head headed goddess, um, which is not Hathor. Um, it's not Sekhmet either, but it's another lion head goddess suckling one of the earlier pharaohs. It's very hard to, to, to make that out though. Um, and of course it's Hathor's hairstyle that appears on these Syrian nude female figurines from the Levant and Egypt. So these Egyptian goddesses like Hathor were kind of acted as this divine wet nurse and they, they legitimized the king, they provided him potency um, and power. And we even see this, these same traditions infiltrating other literature. Um, this is the Neo-Assyrian, some of the Neo-Assyrian texts. So this is an empire that flourished in the Near East in the early part of the first millennium BCE. And one of the kings, Ashurbanipal says, I knew no father or mother. I grew up in the lap of my goddess. As a child, the great gods guided me, going with me on the right and the left, the lady of Nineveh, who is Ishtar, the mother who bore me, endowed me with unparalleled kingship, the Lady of Arbella, also Ishtar from another city-state, my creator ordered everlasting life for me. And in another part of this hymn, um, the god Nabu says to Ashurbanipal, the king, says, you were a baby Ashurbanipal when you sat in the lap of the queen of Nineveh, Ishtar. For four tits you placed in your mouth, two you suck and two you milk to your face. Um, which is a very strange, Imagery, uh, but it sounds like it's kind of evoking this bovine, this cow character of these goddesses again. So the, the nursing from a goddess did not necessarily mean a king was born from the goddess or born from her womb, but it symbolized this intimacy and this connection with the gods via the breast milk. And breast milk was a substance seen to confer power and status and um, kinship, uh, relationship on an individual. And, and once again, departing from our modern 21st century concepts, uh, breast milk had really powerful kinship, not kingship, but kinship, like relationship forging properties in the ancient world. Uh, and sometimes it was even more powerful than blood. Um, shared beliefs across cultural groups concerning breast milk and its power in bestowing kingship and legitimacy can be seen in various lit literary sources. Um, Hebrew texts, for instance, the Hebrew Bible, um, feature women from Israel and Judah. They're often royal or uh, of priestly status. And sometimes they're quite old, but they, they're seen to breastfeed and legitimize some of the male ancestors. Um, even the texts from the Hebrew Bible from the exile and post-exile periods um, talk about this Jerusalem itself as a child nursing, and I quote, the milk of nations and the breasts of kings. And that's the book of Isaiah. Um, in other instances, the Israelite nation is said to nurse at the breasts of Jerusalem. And so this metaphor uh, is a big, has actually been connected by scholars to these Judean pillar figurines as well, who cut their breasts with their hands. And it's, it's important to mention that another 
major type of female imagery that emerges alongside the nude female is this nursing female, um, this, this divine wet nurse um, seen in monumental Egyptian imagery in the Syrian ivory plaque already mentioned. Um, and it becomes this nursing imagery becomes very popular in the Iron Age in the early first millennium, particularly through images of the goddess Isis nursing Horus and who the god Horus represents the earthly pharaoh. These appear, these, these the same type of motifs that start appearing in Greek sanctuaries and grave assemblages. In some cases, it's, it is nude females who actually nurse uh, little babies or infants or sometimes more grown uh, kind of young children. And, uh, you know, and some scholars maintain that the nursing female is this more maternal goddess, this maternal figure, and the nude female is this more um, dangerous sexualized figure associated with goddesses like Ishtar. But, you know, if, if, we, assume, if we associate the nude female only with Ishtar, and not the nursing female, then we still have to consider one of uh, Ishtar's primary roles in the Near East, which is the conferral of legitimacy on kings through nursing. So this is the one I showed you before of King Ashurbanipal. And in some cases, this relationship with the king and Ishtar was both sexual and maternal, um, which may seem a bit strange, but you know, this, this is a much earlier hymn from a much earlier period, but this king Ishmael Dagan says, may my spouse, Inanna Ishtar, a you cherishing its lamb be praised with sweet admiration. So he seems to call her both his spouse and, and assume that, and, and assert himself as her lamb. So I think these cross associations must leave open the possibility that the nude standing female um, who's often evoked uh, showing holding her breasts out represented the potency of life giving substance from these goddesses that was so often evoked as conferring heroism, divinity, and legitimacy on individuals in, in the Near East. And I, I, have less, I have less time to talk about the genitalia, because I want to move into my final words now, but I have you talked about that, but it, the genitalia too are associated with the transference of vitality and power in several legit, uh, literary traditions. So with this argument in mind, we, we can turn back to the Greek world and ask whether this interpretation actually fits for the nude female in Greek sanctuaries. Um, it, nudity had many different meanings. It's a very complex concept. It can be both positive and negative. And it seems in, in ancient Greek literature, when mortal women fair their breasts, it's quite um, it, in very desperate, stressful circumstances, great danger and vul vulnerability. Um, examples include Queen Hecuba of Troy, when she asks her son Hector not to go fight Achilles, uh, and then Queen Clytemnestra before her son Orestes kills her. Um, but they both do this in a, an attempt to emphasize kinship with their sons. Uh, I'll give you the passage where Hecuba bears her breast. And for, this is from the Iliad. And for her part, his mother in turn wailed and shed tears, loosening the folds of her robe, while with the other hand, she held out her breast. And shedding tears, she spoke to him winged words, Hector, my child, respect this and pity me if ever I gave you the breast to lull your pain. So with goddesses, uh, Hera is a great example of a deity who confers legitimacy on gods and heroes, in particular Heracles or, or Hercules through her breast milk. And this is known from several mythical traditions. It's known in art in Italy. A lot of these uh, several mirrors show this episode of Hera essentially nursing Hercules as, a, as an adult possibly before he is made a god, he's brought to heaven at the end of his labors and made a god. And so, um, yeah, and so th there's, there's a real fascinating association with this imagery in Italy, also with funerary art, suggesting that this was a means to the afterlife as well. We, we do find nursing figurines in Greek tombs, uh, as well as in Italian tombs. And other goddesses, I, I won't go into all the different passages, but for example, Demeter, uh, in mythical tradition, nurses the uh, local prince of Eleusis named Demophon. Um, Athena nourishes Athens' mythical king Erechtheus. Uh, Aphrodite gives birth to Aeneas, who in later Roman tradition is the hero who sailed from Troy and founds the, the people who become the people of Rome. Um, and 
we do find images of nursing figurines in Greek sanctuaries and graves. We even find images in Greek sanctuaries of the Egyptian goddess Isis nursing Horus. Um, but I do think that, and I'm, like I said, I'm not going to go into the, the, new, the literary nuances of all this, but if you do read the literature closely, like some of these epics and hymns in the Greek world, it does seem that they shy away from explicitly acknowledging goddesses as, as suckling heroes at their breasts. Um, as I said, this imagery never appears in the Greek world, only in Italy, of Hera nursing Hercules. And the language that the, the Greek authors tend to use is much more ambiguous. They'll say, oh, she nourished him or she held him close to her. Um, they do have words for suckling that they very direct words that they could use, like drinking breast milk, but they, they tend not to use that, which, which I find very interesting. So, um, you know, can we still see similar traditions of this long history uh, of this image across, across its, the use in the Near East and Egypt? And can we apply it to the appearance of Greek sanctuaries in the Iron Age, despite the fact that the Greek seems somewhat uncomfortable with this idea? I think I suggest that both the timing, here's a chart with the rise and fall of these figurine appearances in the, in the Greek world. Um, I think it's important, um, specifically its appearance in the eighth century, its popularity in the seventh and its decline in the sixth um, and its situation in sanctuaries. Um, Politically and socially, this period in the Greek world was a time of upheaval. Um, it saw a number of city states across the Greek world saw the rise and fall of tyrants and uh, struggles amongst elites to gain power and legitimize themselves against both one another, as well as the emerging communities, right? Uh, emerging communal consciousness. This, this process was in no way uniform across the Greek world. It didn't result in our modern definitions of democracies and not all city states became democracies in the ancient Greek world. Um, but I think the overall effects of these social reforms were far reaching. And they're very much reflected in what we see in sanctuaries. Um, and the, all the exotic, those imports and you know, the, the gold work and the ivory and, and um, the ivory carvings of the cauldrons, all those things I talked about as being hallmarks of the orientalizing period also seem to follow this. I don't have nice numerical numbers, but they seem to follow this rise and decline as well. And I argue that this, these patterns do reflect the changing socio-political conditions in the Greek world. Um, between when these figurines are at their heights, they tend to often be associated, as Nano Maranatos argued, with scenes of male hunting and warfare. Um, this is a scene from the, these are images from, of Otis from the sanctuary of Sparta, showing that this is a nude female, an example. Imagery of warriors, this is an ivory carving with a warrior on it. These are drawings of ivory carvings of, of heroes battling monsters. This is probably Heracles and the he Hercules and the Hedra. Perseus and Medusa. Um, and so other examples from Crete show even on the, their, their temple architecture shows nude females. This is from the temple of Prinius on the island of Crete. And then they have these friezes of warrior males as well. And I think the, so this ideology of, of intimacy with these goddesses held special relevancy for many of these elite males in this period between 800 and 600 BCE. And this was something that Nano Maranatos argued. But I think she nonetheless didn't explore the broader implications of this ideology in the Greek world. And I suggest that the appearance of the nude female in the sanctuaries in this period dedicated to powerful goddesses was bound up in these same expressions of power and legitimacy that had been expressed across the Bronze Age, across the Eastern Mediterranean, um, the Near East and Egypt. And so they replicated earlier Near Eastern uses, uh, usages of this imagery, as well as heroic ideals expressed in archaic literature that I had uh, mentioned. Um, and there's numerous other examples of these female deities who protect heroes in, in early literature. The Homeric epics, for instance, Athena is, protects Odysseus, uh, Achilles, and other warriors. And I think the disappearance of this imagery in the sixth century was, was not simply due to Greeks shifting their artistic preferences or becoming embarrassed by nudity, but I think really relates to a shift in how one related to a deity. Um, and in, in eras where kingship was, the, was more and more was the norm divine kingship, this, this kind of imagery really did make sense because it expressed this closeness that elites and kings could, and heroes could enjoy with the gods. Um, and one's legitimacy and power was expressed through intimate relationships with the deity. 
And I think this change emerged alongside these tendencies amongst the Greek city-states for egalitarianism that we witness around the Greek world at this time. And I think that's also why in the literature, in myth and in writing and, and art, that there tends to be a, a somewhat ambiguity, ambivalence towards these, these goddesses nursing heroes. And they, they, they seem to shy, in all instances that I looked at, they seem to shy away from using really explicit terminology. Um, and I guess also, also think the nude female, which was long reduced to a symbol of oriental influence or else rampant fertility and eroticism has a deep, deeper story to tell when it comes to these cross-cultural influences across the Mediterranean and the Near East, and particularly in this formative period. And, um, you know, what was happening in the Greek world and places like Athens is certainly exceptional, uh, but it was not divorced from the wider context of the, of the Near East, the Egyptian and the Mediterranean worlds. And so I think scholarship has moved in the past 10 or 20 years to express this interconnectedness of all these regions. But I still think many aspects of this world, for example, the Orientalism, the Orientalizing period, still remain stuck in outdated paradigms of separateness and difference or East versus West, um, as though like the nude female was some type of foreign or alien life form deposited on Greek soil. So I hope I've demonstrated at least to a small extent the vibrant interconnectedness and the deeper meanings that we can mine when we consider really closely what this imagery might have meant. Uh, and I stress not only the blending of cultures and the collapsing of spatial boundaries, but also the longevity of meanings over time, uh, really attempting to dissolve barriers, not between just East and West, but between the Bronze and Iron Ages. And I think the new female is just really one fascinating example of the symbolism that structured human interaction over vast instances and time scales. It really challenges to rethink our assumptions about how humans express their relationships with the divine. So with that, I'd like to thank you all uh, for joining me and for listening to me. And I welcome any questions that you might have. Well, hello uh, again. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, uh, really uh, rich uh, uh, presentation. And um, uh, before I start uh, uh, going into questions from, uh, uh, from, from our audience, I, I'd like to ask a question that pops out of uh, the maps slash data uh, uh, information that you, you provided. Yeah. It appears as if Crete is really a super rich uh, location for these kinds of uh, uh, finds. Uh, and I wonder uh, whether you have some an, an opinion on whether uh, it's uh, uh, the strength of the data from there is the result of uh, archeological uh, kind of focus or uh, of its uh, a kind of transitional highway kind of uh, uh, position on the way to, uh, to, to, to the Greek world. Um, because if we connect uh, the association of uh, some of these finds with heroic culture and let's say, um, emergence of um, uh, tyrants uh, that would make very good sense with uh, with Samos, um, but what does it do for our understanding of, of Cretan history? I hope that this makes sense as a question. Yeah, and I'm glad, like I'm glad you noticed that pattern, and it it seems to be uncentral in Eastern Crete. Um, and I think it's both a result of some something interesting going on in Crete in the, in in this period, 800 to 600. I think it's somewhat a result of where the excavations are focused. Um, Western Crete, so I just want to say, like, if you're wondering what's wrong, what's happening with Western Crete, I think that's somewhat of a research bias. I think it's less populated. I, I was just showing my students, you know, the Bronze Age sites in Crete, like a map of the sanctuaries and Minoan palaces, and everything's on the central and eastern side, pretty much, not with, with a few exceptions. So, yeah, and the, the Western part of Crete is just is more geologically different and mountainous, as you, as you know. So, but in terms of what the nude females meaning, yes, like in that period, Crete, goes through this really fascinating phase of this vibrant interconnection, right? There's tons of imports at places like Knossos. Um, a number of sanctuaries emerge that also like the, that also have a ton of imports, like the cave of Zeus, uh, of Adean Zeus in Mount Ida. And um, yeah, it, and it, if I put some of the new, like this does not have updated information, but if you put some of the new information, you'd see places like Anavlachos and Rusa Ecclesia, like they just, especially Rusa Ecclesia just shoots off the map. So there's several things. One of the things I'll say is that I'm currently trying to look closer at what's going on in Crete. I have a little research project with students that I'm doing where we're mapping both 
areas where Cretan, where the imports appear, because there's tons of imports, not just in sanctuaries, but in graves. As I said, at Knossos, for example, and a number of graves in those areas. And I'm also we're also mapping where the Iron Age sanctuaries emerge um, over the Bronze to Iron Age transition in Crete. And both of these phenomena, the imports and the sanctuaries, have have these like catalogs, like really rich catalogs that other people have designed. So we're just mapping them to look at them in GIS and then mapping where the nude female figurine uh, emerges. And my hypothesis, and I have to test this still, is that it, while it was seen to be an exotic Eastern import, the nude female figure, I think it's more associated with the, the earlier religious landscape of Crete. Like it doesn't map on to all the places where we get all these other exotic imports, like, like the graves of Knossos, for example. And so my, I'm testing, and I want to make the argument that it actually, like, yes, it's related to, to imagery from the Near East, no doubt, as I, as I showed in this presentation, but it, it, it's, it, it's so deeply intertwined into the local religious landscape of Crete as well. Um, and, and Crete is one area where people have suggested that this, this and other types of female imagery actually is relating to female rituals of maturation, and that's happening at some of these sanctuaries that are kind of, I don't want to say coming of age, because it's like an anachronistic term, but lo loaded term, but like some types of rituals that are, that are being, that are female directed. So I'm not sure about that yet. Um, but yeah, so I think it's got, has a number of things going on. Uh, some, and Crete then has this strange period around 600 BCE, where it's not just the nude female that disappears, but like so much stuff disappears, all the Eastern imports. Um, they used to call it the Cretan Dark Age or the Cretan Gap. They call it the Cretan Gap. It's kind of fifth, sixth, fifth, and fourth century period. And people have gone back and kind of said, well, no, we actually have some evidence, but it, there seems to be a real change in, in, in the artistic and cultural and political landscape of Crete in that period. So yeah, I think it's like, it is kind of a, a real connecting area to, to, to the Near East and that's reflected in other types of things that get imported. People think that there are actual Phoenician and Syrian peoples living on Crete and there are craftspeople who have traveled there. Um, so yeah, so that, I think, hope that answers your question. I have a lot of thoughts. I, I don't have any definite answers yet. I'll stop sharing. No, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is great. I'll, I'll go to some of our um, uh, questions. Uh, so many things uh, from an anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, many thanks for your talk. Uh, does this imagery coincide with the rise of any real female political figures in the Mediterranean? Uh, warriors, queens, thinkers, uh, how these, uh, uh, how are these uh, real life women depicted compared to the goddesses? And then a follow up. Also, you mentioned that these uh, uh, statues can be found uh, uh, in graves, presumably ones of upper class males. Were these uh, figurines then symbols of status to be possessed and forever kept in the private realm? Yeah, to quickly answer the second question. Um, yes, they, they tend to be in high status graves. I don't know if they're all male graves because I don't know if all the graves were studied, if the skeletal material was studied. I have to look back at that. I've, concentrated mostly on sanctuaries as well. But I think uh, nursing females also appear in graves in this period. And I think it has some idea, this has been argued for, as I said, for Italy, that there's some idea of, of rejuvenation attached to this, of rejuvenation in the afterlife. And this is something we see in the Egyptian context too, where the pharaohs, uh, that imagery of, of the pharaoh suckling the cow is from the mortuary temple. And it's showing both divinity and, and importance in life, but also kind of, uh, a sense of rejuvenation in the afterlife. I think, I mean, this is something you'd have to look more carefully at individual cases. I mean, could a nursing female in a grave symbolize someone who was just a good, who was a good mother, right? And this is like later imagery in the Greek world has images of females on, like I'm thinking of Athenian grave reliefs show imagery of, of mothers, right? And it's expressing uh, an important role that they played during their life. So I don't want to say that's true all across the board, but there is this sense of, of being rejuvenated and looked after in the afterlife as well. Um, in terms of how women are portrayed um, in the Greek world, we, uh, female women like we really start to see we see them in vase painting um, as early as the you know then ninth and eighth centuries in kind of more geometric form, but they tend to be clothed. And when they emerge, when they start carving more monumental sanctuaries in the sixth century, 
male figures are new, tend to be nude and the females tend to be clothed. And the question is, some, are these male nude figures heroes? Are they gods? There's questions about that. But they, by and large, in the Greek world after, yeah, it's from the sixth century onwards, seem to focus on showing females as clothed, not always, um, elite, but mortal females, certainly. And it really only shifts in large fashion with the naked version of Aphrodite, which kind of emerges in the late fourth century at, at, with the Aphrodite of Knidos. Once again, there's some exceptions. Um, there's a popular type in Egypt, for example, of Aphrodite or Isis lifting up her skirt, um, showing her, her genitals. Um, now, in terms of one scholar, in terms of the Near East, one scholar I'd point you to, though, uh, who, I, who gave a wonderful presentation uh, at a conference that I attended last September is Amy Gansell, and she's looked at the Neo-Assyrian queens. I hope you can see that in the chat. And she has argued some stuff differently from me about the, the appearance of the nude female in these Neo-Assyrian palaces and how they related to female image and to, to queenly imagery. And so I think I think she's coming out. Sure, it's just come out, or it's about to come out. There's a book on this. I think it's come out already. So um, I think I would really refer you to her research because I, I and I I myself have I, it was the first time I'd seen that research in this conference. And so it's certainly something I have to kind of take into account as well to, to nuance some of my arguments. But that being said, I mean queens did approximate goddesses in the ancient world too. This happens in Egypt, it happens in, in the Near East, um, where they they kind of do take on this persona of the goddesses in some cases. There's been lots of arguments for that, for um, queens appropriating half doors kind of identity. Sometimes it's a priestly identity, but sometimes it's more divine identity. There's this idea of like the sacred marriage ceremony where the king marries the goddess, but he really marries the queen. But lots of questions about how that actually happened in the ancient world. So there's definitely crossover between queens and goddesses too, just like there's kings and goddesses. The, uh, the, the mention to uh, Amy Gansel and, uh, and, and the work on queenly representations in the Near East, I think uh, uh, allows us to transition to uh, Danai Thomaidis' this is a qu a question that uh, uh, asks, uh, could the rise and fall of these figures in Greece be associated with passages from uh, matriarchal uh, ideology or power for that matter to more patriarchal society? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, this, you know, this has been a long-standing idea of, you know, the, and it's kind of been revived with ancient DNA recently, where it was shown that the people from the north came into Europe around the fourth millennium, and they brought the Indo-European language, and they kind of overran these more peaceful matriarchal societies. So that's something that's definitely an argument that's kind of applied to much earlier periods that the Indo-Europeans kind of shift from these matriarchal goddess-centered societies to patriarchal god-centered ones. I think it's a, it's definitely been problematized and it's a bit of a, a, a sweeping a picture of something that was much more complex. Um, but in the ancient world, I, you know, in the periods that I'm dealing with, I, it seems to be always almost almost always male power, right? That's that's utilizing these goddesses and and they're and they themselves, the god the Ishtar, definitely Aphrodite, definitely are, are ambiguous gender-wise as well. Uh, definitely, we have lots of evidence of Ishtar's cult. Um, Kaibili, a goddess worship in, in Anatolia, is another example of a real, like the, the priestess, the priests tend to be eunuchs. Um, they have festivals where people swap clothing. Um, they, you know, there's this suggestion that um, people get were punished for desecrating a temple of Astarte with, by being turned into females. So there is a lot of gender ambiguity too uh, between, and yeah, why this happens is, is is interesting. Like I think a lot of it had to do with something beyond just kingship. I think it had to do with um, society and the, I don't know, it's like the, the kind of capricious nature of these goddesses that had to be harnessed by kings uh, and by doing the right thing and by, by performing rituals. Um, because certainly the, the early literature of Ishtar shows her kind of changing sides with which king, right? If kings are kind of in, in conflict with one another over land or over resources, which they often were in the ancient world. You know, the, the one who comes out on top is said to be the one who's beloved by Ishtar. So it always seems to be something, a, a, a goddess who hinges around male leadership. And I don't see it, for me in my research, at least in the Bronze and Iron Ages, I don't see this kind of transition 
to from patriarchal to matriarchal societies. But I guess if you want to draw deeper, longer term connections to figurines going back to the Neolithic that are nudes, that might be something else. That that might be something else. Like art, and I've never tried to make those really long term connections to those Neolithic figurines, like the the Venus type figurines, those heavy um, female figurines that that. The Venus of Willendorf being the most famous example. So, you know, if you could make that connection, maybe it does stem from a time when rulership was differently based. But yeah, not not in the periods that I examine. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I find uh, the connection, the reference you made to, to Anatolia kind of um, uh, interesting because uh, just this morning, just uh, through Twitter, nothing scientific, uh, I saw a posted image of a, of a coin from a Roman era Iconion. Uh, which represents uh, what people think is either um, uh, Aphrodite or Andromeda, perhaps, uh, uh, by the water. It looks like a pool or something like that. And you think that this is a, a Roman era city whose demos decides to, to put this imagery uh, on their currency. And, and how is this kind of selection negotiated by a demos thinking about a nude figure? And if it's Andromeda, of course, then the Near Eastern connections start getting <laughs> uh, rather interesting. Yeah, that is, and but they they do become also goddess. That's what, what I argue in my book because I didn't get into this is that they're goddesses of the people too, and that's what makes the ideology so long-standing. Like Aphrodite becomes a goddess of the magistrates later on, and she's Pandemos, right, in certain parts of the Greek world, which is Aphrodite for all the people. So is that kind of what you're saying? Like it's like the mm -hmm. people kind of vote, yeah. So and and I think Ishtar too. Like she sometimes she's mentioned as the goddess of the assembly, like. She's the, the festivals are pe everyone participates in. So it's not just this exclusive, like the kings are, you know, alone worshiping Ishtars. This, you know, I think it's something that made sense to the rest of society. Yeah. Um, uh, another question uh, references uh, were made to the goddess Ishtar. Uh, would she be uh, uh, an equivalent for uh, Athena? Um, uh, and is she ever? And if yes, uh, is she ever depicted with armor by her side, the way that Athena would uh, be represented? Yes, Ish, well, the equivalence is more ambiguous, but certainly Ishtar is a warrior goddess, and many cylinder seals show her standing on the lion. But instead of being nude in this sense, she's got a kind of a robe on with weapons, quivers and arrows or spears uh, on her back. So this is a very popular imagery of Ishtar. Um, so is she related to Athena? I mean, there's probably some deeper relation. I think we tend to say, oh, you know, Aphrodite equals Ishtar, Aphrodite equals a sharp starte, or Athena equals this goddess. And certainly people in the ancient world would make those assumptions when they would come into contact with one another. And they, Herodotus assumes if Aphrodite is, is a starte in his histories. But it was much, it's not a clear cut one to one, like that's it, like Athena equals Ishtar or Aphrodite equals this goddess. Like it seems to be so much messier. And I think we want to make it like this goddess equals this goddess, right? Uh, Zeus equals this god in the Near East. And it just seems like it's not one to one. <laughs> it's just, it's, me it's much messier, right? And so could attributes of Athena relate to Ishtar? Certainly, um, absolutely. But attributes of Athena could also relate to Astarte or could also relate to uh, other goddesses as well. And same with Aphrodite and, and Hera as well. Like sometimes, you know, where Astarte was worshipped by the Phoenicians, the when the Romans or whoever take over a site in later periods, it's not Aphrodite or Venus, it's Juno or Hera. Like there's just, it's just so messy. That's all I can really say is that there's probably some association, but it's it's not a clear one-to-one -one association ever. And speaking of association, uh, I'm almost surprised that um, did not come up earlier. Nina Hull asks, uh, 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 do you think there is a connection between uh, the nude female cultures, uh, sculptures in the uh, ancient Near East and depiction of the bare-breasted women from Minoan Crete? Uh, it was a bit heard. earlier. Yeah, but it's still Bronze Age, right? And I, ha I haven't really thought about that. People, you, they often ask about the Cycladic figurines, those other, those little white, that they're, they're painted, but they're, they're often depicted white with the arms across the chest. And uh, I've always, you know, once again, I, there's, there might be some connection with it, but um, and especially the, the, the bearing of the breasts, I guess we haven't really like, we, I don't, I've, you know, why did they, what, what did that actually symbolize? Were these ceremonial costumes, like the imagery we have tends to be high class 
fresco paintings in the palaces of Minoan Crete. The snake, I think of the snake goddess as well. So maybe, I actually have, yeah, I've, 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 hesit I've tried away from drawing too wide a association because there's some, just with like the goddesses, once again, associating goddesses with one another, there probably is some link, right, between all of these traditions um, that evolve and change over time. And so I think you could draw, maybe you could make that case. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've just, I've, I've tried to kind of focus in order to make it clean or as clean as I can in what, what is really a messy interconnected polytheistic world is to focus on, you know, the imagery that we can actually really trace, but it might have, I, you know, it's something that's worth looking into, I think. I have a, a question on, uh, on uh, the questions of uh, uh, milk and blood uh, mm -hmm. and, the, and the kind of uh, either distinction or parallel kind of existence of that thinking that you, you drew on. And, and I wonder, uh, what uh, our uh, textual um, uh, tradition uh, uh, tells us about uh, how people thought about the respective strengths of those. Because from a voter perspective, if we were to just project it backwards, um, the culture that emphasizes uh, uh, the milk is almost an integrative culture because it uh, allows for adoption. I'm thinking of wet nurses, um, whereas blood might appear as stronger. Is there uh, a tradition that would make uh, uh, milk stronger than blood, for example, or can we start drawing uh, uh, some, uh, not drawing conclusions, but can we start thinking about societies that are more open to bringing in uh, outsiders? Yeah, because they're more, is it they're more interested in outsiders, or is it kind of a shorthand way to kind of like, I, you know, the way it plays, it seems to play out in like the Hebrew text is it's more just a way to make sure someone's legitimized, right? And the first time I, I, so I, I don't know if I would associate it with just openness to outsiders, because it still seems like something that's exclusive, it's a exclusively royal. Mm -hmm. That being said, the first time I ever came across this concept was in a fiction book that I was reading. And I happened to be finished my dissertation at some somewhat the same time and seeing this imagery and wondering about it. And it was called, it's a book is called Samarkand, and it's about the, the poet Omar Khayyam and the the way his poems travel, make it into the modern world. Um, and this fellow from Massachusetts ends up embroiled in this mystery around this po poem. And he's hiding in a house in Iran during these revolutionary period in the early 20th century. And the woman who takes care of him, I guess she has a daughter and in order that nothing happens between his daughter and him, she has him, she adopts him and she has him like nurse at his breast, right? And so that was what I, I thought it was like the weirdest thing ever. And so this seems, then I, I, I was doing some more anthropological research and it just, it seems to be something that yeah, is a symbolic gesture of adopting someone. He didn't actually, you know, he just, it was just simply a gesture that he was made to do. Once again, it would seem very strange in our society, right? To have, to have you do something like that to, to someone. Um, and so I started, yeah, and I came across like, these, these references from the Hebrew Bible and some of this literature as well. And there's even let, like references in Greece and some of the inscriptions talk about uh, homo galactes, like milk men, milk friendship men. And people mm -hmm. have wondered, and like in Athens, I think, like fourth century Athens. And so there's, you know, it seems like the, and people have argued, well, what does that mean? Um, to some, you know, some people have related to the symbol, symbol, symbolism of the polis, like they, like Pericles says, you know, you're to be lovers of the polis. And so the polis is what's nurturing, like the, you know, the young Thebes and the young men who are going to defend it. Um, others have suggested it's because they share in the same flocks, like the same farm animals and they're drinking. That's what makes them the homo, homo galactus. So yeah, we just see this, you just kind of see notions of this concept. And I think, you know, if, I think one of my colleagues would be better to talk about birth and all that, but certainly I still think being born from the womb, of course, was significant. But I think what it also alerted me to was, was the role that breast milk and breasts could play in symbolizing some type of symbolic kinship, right? That we wouldn't, we ourselves wouldn't draw, usually draw that um, in our world. It's something we just think, you know, you're born from someone, you're born from the womb. 
that you belong, that's your family and there's nothing else that can really make you family. Yes, you can formally adopt people and that makes you family, of course, but this was kind of a way to formalize intimacy and kinship in the ancient world too. So let me try and see if I can get uh, Jonathan who has a raised hand uh, to uh, ask a question. I don't know. Uh, let me unmute. Um, okay, Jonathan, do you wanna ask a question? Oh, he asked it in the uh, chat. Still, okay. Is it in chat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, he says, I'm wondering, did archaeologists find any figurines at Gobleke Tepe along T-shaped pillars? Any thoughts? Many thanks for this fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, I think just those pillars. I don't know if they found figurines either. I know they found uh, animal remains and I think maybe plastered skulls too. There's some suggestion of those. And then the pillars show a whole range of different animal types. I was actually just going over Gobleke Tepe with my students the other day, but I don't know if they found figurines. I really didn't, <laughs> sorry. Um, just, just a lot of fascinating, oh, he can't hear, he says. Oh. Oh, that's odd. Yeah. Because I can, I can hear you well. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll try and uh, get um, uh, another question in. It's a, it's a bit uh, vaguer, but uh, um, uh, could you comment on an archaeological find? I'm not sure uh, what find, of course, that is specifically that seemed to show Yahweh with a concubine or uh, uh, some sort of uh, goddess. Uh, Sorry, that what was the concubine? The uh, uh, Yahweh, uh, so uh, Hebrew god, I guess. Oh, Yahweh. Yeah. Um, oh, well, there yeah so on one hand some have argued because they appear, those huge figurines appear in graves i forgot to mention this on the grave question some have argued that they served as concubines to the dead so just like you needed to take food to your afterlife you needed women i suppose um, but the yahweh link um he's often some of the texts and imagery in different sites in the new in the levant show um what's similar it's not the nude female figure herself but it's the animals that she's often associated with like lions on either side of this tree pole it's like a tree and in the ancient near East, in, in the hebrew bible the there's this object called the asherah which seems to be this pole associated with yahweh but asherah also seems to relate to an earlier goddess i mentioned her when i was talking about drinking breast milk. He says she, he'll drain the breast of the goddess Atharat. And that seemed to be this the goddess. And so in some of the texts from around the Levantine, the Levant and the Iron Age, it's they speak of Yahweh and his Asherah. And so people have suggested that Yahweh has a, a female consort, like many male gods did, and female Ishtar has a male consort. And this is a this is a much deeper history. And once again, I have colleagues who study Yahweh. Um, and would know more about this, but yeah, it, it seems like so, some of the imagery of Asherah is this same imagery associated with the nude female, because it's like lions, and then she seems to be this tree pole, and then in the Bible, her name seems to be pole, and but yet she also seems to be a goddess. So, um, and you know, Jaffe, when people study his long history, the long history of the Hebrew God, he comes from a longer line of tradition, you know, it's, it's contextualizing Israel, which yes, once again, just like the Greeks goes into this very interesting path towards monotheism, but also is part of this deeper Near Eastern world. And that may, and so, yeah, so it's suggested that Yahweh has a, like a consort goddess named Asherah, who could be the, related to the nude female figurines too, but we're, I'm not sure. So uh, mindful of time and uh, of your uh, generous uh, commitment to, to, our, to our talk, I'll, um, I'll throw two, uh, two questions uh, at you and uh, then we can uh, perhaps conclude. Uh, and one kind of uh, uh, asks uh, uh, about the reverse picture. Uh, uh, do we see uh, Greek influences on Near Eastern female uh, imagery? Uh, so sort of the reverse um, that we can discuss. And, um, and the other one uh, uh, take, uh, takes us to something you said earlier about um, 
uh, comments on uh, the lewdness or the weirdness and barbarity of uh, the Canaanites, uh, goddesses. And um, I'm thinking that these are comments that come at a time when, you know, um, kind of colonial English, at least, uh, uh, travelers would uh, also be probably encountering Indian uh, sculptures uh, with uh, similarly lewd uh, kind of representations. And I wonder whether there is a vernacular of uh, kind of critique on, uh, on the female form that travels uh, in the scholarship of, uh, of that time. So these two very different questions, but so that yeah, we can... I'll answer the second one first, like, pro yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that idea of, of nudity, of the, I mean, I guess for the British people, the Victorian era has this kind of playfulness in version, both a version of playfulness with, with nudity. And I don't know so much about the Victorian era, but yeah, I think it must have, it might've come across, it, it, it definitely has these kind of colonialist undercurrents, right? About these, this is Orientalism, right? Like anything, it's not just the Middle East. Orientalism really meant any, anyone who is perceived to be non-Western, right? Is, is kind of defined as the other, as the as the opposite. And Israel, it's interesting that, oh, the Israel is like, they're, they're you know, even the Egyptians, they call more modestly garbed females. And during the time when, you know, Albright's writing this in the 30s and 40s, and there, I think there's probably also political reasons, too, with how people feel about Israel and the creation of the state of, of Israel, too. Um, this has been suggested. Oh, okay. uh, um, and so there's something going on there. But there definitely seems to be a hatred of the, the Canaanites, too. Like they seem to be this, yeah, these lewd, carnal people, right? And yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's kind of important, and also, I mean, it's not just the creation of Israel. I mean, they themselves, are, many of them are Christians and are, you know, have these uh, leanings towards monotheism, monotheism themselves. So, see, I guess, see anything outside of that as, 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 as Oriental in that kind of Orientalist perspective. In terms of Greek influences going eastwards, in terms of the new female, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that. Um, one thing that the Greeks do differently with the nude female in some cases is they have a much higher headdress. I can't, you can't see me, but they're wearing like a higher headdress uh, that they call the polos. And so um, it'd be interesting to see if that shows up in the Near Eastern world, but I don't think so. Um, and I'd have to think about that more. I, I just gave a talk on Naucritus, um, which is this Greek emporium in the Nile Delta in Egypt also dating to this kind of same period, the seventh, sixth centuries and Aphrodite is worshiped there. And it's interesting to see a combination of like Cypri Cypriot imagery, Egyptian imagery, Greek imagery of, of this, these interrelated goddesses, once again, Hathor, the Cypriot goddess kind of show up at her temple. So, you know, so that's, that's a, I think in certain contexts, these things kind of swirl around each other and influence each other. There's, and then, so yeah, I'd have to think more about that question. Um, there's one interesting article about Greek goddesses influencing deeper traditions in the Near East, um, and particularly the goddess Leucothea, who's a who's a very mysterious goddess, but who seems Margaret. It's by Margaret Finkelberg. I'll type this. The article I've always loved, um, and how that like the in a lot of this was the Greek it was migrate Greeks migrating in the Iron Age into. Asia Minor, right, and kind of these post Bronze Age collapse traditions, and and how this goddess is kind of then reflected in Levantine Phoenician ideas as well. So I don't know. I mean, I'd have to think about that question a little more admittedly, though. Uh, yeah, there's certainly been studies of artistic influences, and we should be obviously, as I, if I'm arguing to collapse these boundaries, I should, we should be thinking of them as traveling, you know, in many directions. Well, uh, with that, uh, uh, I would really like uh, uh, to thank you both on the center's behalf, but also on behalf of our audience for uh, uh, a, a really rich uh, evocative presentation uh, and, a, and, a, and, a real, and a truly uh, engaged uh, uh, discussion with uh, our, our, our audience. Uh, and uh, before uh, uh, we, we go, and of course, I, I would like to thank our, our audience for, for, for being uh, with us. Uh, uh, today and for uh, sort of adjusting to the shift of venue, uh, which in our time has become um, uh, just a part of life. Uh, before we before we conclude, uh, I would like to point out for uh, for everyone that our uh, next event will take place on Friday, uh, March uh, the fourth, and will feature Dr. Ilaria Batirolo, Batiloro, 
from Mount Allison University for her talk, The Venus Pompeiana Project, New Discoveries at the Sanctuary of Venus in uh, Pompeii. Uh, registration for this event uh, will uh, be opening up in um, uh, the coming weeks. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I wanna thank you all for being uh, with us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Daniels. And uh, I, I will say that I'm really looking forward to the opportunity of actually having these events again in, uh, in person as soon as possible while maintaining the flexibility of the hybrid event. Thanks again. Thank you everyone for inviting me.